We know that the church is, belongs to the Lord in one sense, it belongs to us. And it's what he, the Lord is building in this world. It's his priority in this world. It's the object of his shepherding love and the focus of his attention. We're gathered as a, a local church here this morning. But a question that I think is good for us to ask is what makes the church the church? What sets it apart? Uh, and I think the... Uh, that addresses another question, who, who are we? Who are the ones that are part of this church? What characterizes people that are part of Christ's kingdom, part of his work on earth? Uh, so we want to begin this, and I, uh, I want to just let you know up front that um, we're going to be on this for several weeks because there's a great deal said about who we are as a church who we are as individuals and collectively as a church. But I want to begin with the Jesus' first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5. And uh, the, this sermon goes for three chapters, 5 through 7. We're going to look this, this morning at the Beatitudes in verses 3 through 12, as we read this morning. And uh, next week I want to look at the Similitudes, uh, verses uh, 13 through 16. <clears throat> so what do the people who belong to the Lord look like? Who are they? Well, I think these Beatitudes lay out the characteristic of God's people. The first characteristic is they honestly accept God's evaluation. They honestly accept God's evaluation. That's verses 3 through 5. The first part of his evaluation is our spiritual poverty. He says here, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's describing us who are part of this kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He, he says that they are ones who are spiritually poor, have a spiritual poverty. Before I go any further, there are not only notes to fill in the blanks, but there are also questions that we're going to be going over tonight. So uh, any of you that have those and uh, are going to be here tonight, make sure you uh, look at those while we're uh, preaching. All right. Now notice what he says here. He says, poor in spirit. In other words, this is an internal poverty. This is a spiritual poverty. This is a poverty in relating to God because God is spirit. Um, in John 4, 24, it says that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The word he uses for poor uh, refers to a beggar who is utterly uh, in utter poverty and depends on the mercy of others to provide for his needs. So Jesus is speaking of one who is blessed by having a place in God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. In other words, heaven awaits for this type of person, the one who agrees with God that they have no resources in themselves to commend them to God. They are in utter spiritual poverty. They are beggars spiritually. And so in any way to, re, to relate to God in any way, they must have some work done for them because there's nothing inside of them. And so when they reach into their heart, there's nothing there that would bring them to God. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. A deceitful, desperately wicked heart does not commend you to God. It does not point you to God. It does not give you a desire to know God. It does just the opposite. When they search out their minds, their thinking, there is nothing there 
to commend them to God. In Colossians 1, verse 21, it says, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled. And so they search out their minds, and there's nothing in their mind that would commend them to God or even draw them to God. Because their mind is, is alienated from God, and in their mind they are enemies of God. And that shows up in their wicked works. When they search out their religiousness, or they search out their heritage, there is nothing there to commend them to God. Uh, Paul had it all, he thought. Uh, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, he speaks of his religiousness and his, his heritage. Cir circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. Hebrew of the Hebrew, concerning the law of Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. In fact, in the next verse, he calls all those things rubbish to know Christ. Th these are worthless if you want to know Christ. And so all of his heritage and all of his religiousness didn't do anything to commend him to God. It was actually drawing him away from God not commending him to God. And he had to look away from all of that to Christ in order to know God. In other words, they and we are spiritually bankrupt in and of ourselves. Totally dependent on the mercy of God to bring us to God. We're beggars. Beggars, in, in the day that, that Jesus was, was speaking here in his sermon, beggars depended upon those who would show them mercy and give them some, some alms uh, in order for them to live, in order for them to eat and survive. And that's how we come to God. But Jesus said of these ones that they are blessed. He says they're blessed with heaven. Spiritually bankrupt people are promised heaven. Not because they're spiritually bankrupt, but because they understand that they are spiritually bankrupt. Now I want you to see that all of these beatitudes connect one to the, to the other because the next one speaks of um, spiritual sorrow. He says... Um, Blessed are those who mourn, verse 4, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn. And of course, this mourning that he's talking about here, this sorrow he's talking about, is connected with spiritual poverty. And so, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn. They're spiritually bankrupt, they're, they're spiritual pover beggars, and he says, blessed are those who mourn over that condition that condition that they see themselves in, a condition that God reveals to us. God shows us what's in our heart. God shows us our need. He helps us to see that, that there's nothing that we can offer to God that would commend us to God and reconcile us to him. And so when he speaks about this mourning, this sorrow, he is saying, happy are the ones who accept God's evaluation of their spiritual poverty and sorrow over it. Do you see your spiritual poverty? Praise God, that's, that's a work of God's Spirit. Do you have a sorrow over that spiritual poverty? That's also a work of God. He says, happy are the ones who accept God's evaluation of their spiritual poverty. The word for sorrow here is one of the strongest words in the Greek language for sorrow. It expresses a deep sorrow and sadness uh, or grief. Um, and grief is sometimes the, the deepest sorrow that we experience. Uh, this word is commonly used of the sorrow of death. Uh, that is, the sorrow of, of losing a loved one to death. It's a deep, deep sorrow. And this sorrow is expressed, Jesus says, over our spiritual 
poverty, over being poor in spirit, over our, our lack of, of anything that would to bring us to God or commend us to God. And what a miserable condition we're in when it comes to God. This godly sorrow is a sorrow that leads to repentance. And I believe he, this is what he's talking about here, a godly sorrow. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 speak of this godly sorrow. He says, Now I rejoice not that you are made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss uh, from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. He's not talking here, Jesus is not talking just about a general sorrow. He's not talking about a worldly sorrow. He's talking about a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. So we see our condition before God, we look at it, we see how helpless we are before God and how unable we are to please Him. We sorrow over that in a godly way and that leads to a repentant attitude, a repentant heart and repentant actions. Jesus promises that this kind of godly sorrow over our spiritual poverty will be comforted. It's comforted because we've, we've come to agreement with God concerning our condition. But in mercy, as we, as we sorrow and express that before God, in mercy, God comforts us with his forgiveness and with his reconciliation. I want to tell you, God's forgiveness is a great comfort. Amen? And knowing that by the work of of Jesus Christ alone, I am reconciled to God, that's a great comfort. If it, if it depended on me measuring up, that'd be miserable. <laughs> Wouldn't it? It'd be miserable if I thought I had to measure up, if I thought I had to do it. But that God, through Christ, has done the work. And because of Christ, I'm reconciled. That is, that is so comforting. Next, we see him speak about spiritual humility. In verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. The word meek means gentle or humble. And I think it's what it's doing is describing what's just taken place here in the, these Beatitudes. In other words, seeing your spiritual pro poverty and having a genuine um, godly sorrow over it is a display of humility. How many of you here like to admit you're wrong? <laughs> I don't see any hands. How many, how many of you here are willing to admit that your spouse was wrong? <laughs> yeah, you're afraid to put your hands up. Huh? Your spouse is sitting next to you. Or somebody else. It was the other driver or humanly. Our hearts deceive us and make it hard for us to see that we're wrong. So when we see this poverty of spirit, when God actually opens up our eyes and helps us to see that, that's a work of God's grace. And that we can actually admit it and be honest with God about our spiritual poverty and confess it to Him. That's a work of God's grace. And it, and it displays a humility that we don't naturally have. It displays a meekness that God does. God enables us to see all of this. Because a humble person does not exalt himself, is not self-focused. But boy, when, I'm, when I refuse to admit that I'm wrong, I'm, I'm pretty much self-focused. I'm, I'm like Adam, you know. It's the woman you gave me. Or like Eve. No, it's a serpent. It's a serpent. He did it. 
Humility looks away from self to find that there's only spiritual poverty in me. That's all I find, all right? I'm, I'm spiritual, a spiritual beggar. That's all I find. That's it. I'm not finding anything there. I don't have any resources to get me to God, to make me right, to find forgiveness and reconciliation. I humble myself before God, look away from myself, and I look to Him. Look to God, agree with Him on His assessment, and sorrow over what He reveals to me. That's all a display of genuine humility. And this response of humility and meekness and lowliness of heart, it all is, is what God does in us in order for us to be able to respond in the right way to him. I like what James says in James 4, 6. He gives more grace. That is God. God gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. <laughs> gives grace to the humble. When we are uh, proud and blaming everyone else for what we've done wrong, God resists that. When it's all about us, God resists that. God fights against that. When we think that, oh, all I have to do is look to my heart and that'll give me the right direction, oh, no, God resists that. He gives grace to the humble, those who see their spiritual beggars, those who sorrow in a godly way over that and therefore display a genuine humility. So a meek person does not seek to justify themselves. Instead, they trust God through Christ to justify them. Romans 5.1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God justifies us through Christ. When, when you're like Adam, trying to justify yourself, well, it really wasn't my fault because the woman you gave me, she gave it to me and I ate, he was trying to justify himself. That's what we do when we, when we blame others. We blame our circumstances instead of taking the responsibility ourselves. We're, we're showing our pride instead of our humility. And we're trying to justify ourselves. But a meek person doesn't do that. A meek person, instead of justifying themselves, looks to God to justify them. <clears throat> I stand righteous before God, not because I'm righteous. Not because I've done everything right. Not because I've never sinned. But because Christ justified me. Through his work on the cross, giving his life. And so we see that those who are part of God's work in this world, part of his church, they are ones who honestly accept God's evaluation of them. Do you accept God's evaluation of your spiritual poverty? Do you accept that evaluation and does it make you genuinely sorry before God? Grieving before God because of, of how you have offended him and, and, and how there's, there's nothing in you to pull up and, and, and to get to, to, in order to stop that? And that God is your only resource? And so you humbly come to Him? That's what it looks like to be one of God's children. That's what it looks like to be part of His church. That's how we come. And that's how we live. And it says of these meek people, they will inherit the earth. The earth is not going to be inherited by politicians. Aren't you glad? <laughs> it's not going to be inherited by military might. It won't be inherited by influential and powerful people. It'll be, it'll be inherited by the most unlikely people of all, meek people who have conquered nothing, but instead have been conquered by God. Those are the ones who will inherit the earth. <clears throat> it's the meek people who the humble people who are truly blessed, that are truly happy. <clears throat> and they will obtain what many people have fought 
and struggle to obtain, and they will inherit the earth. Now I want you to notice how this humility brings blessing. And so our second main point is they humbly receive God's resources. They see no resources in themselves, they're beggars. And so they're, they're holding out their, their cup like a beggar. And they're looking to God for what they need because they, they, they don't have anything. That's the picture here. And so they humbly receive God's resources. What are God's resources? Well, first of all, his resources is to give you a new hunger. Blessed are those, verse 6, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. We're happy when we hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, we can hunger and thirst for a lot of things. And uh, you, you look in the world today, and people are hungering and thirsting after all kinds of things. It's interesting that he uses the, these terms, hunger and thirst, because those are primal desires. They are the most basic desires in our body. And they cry out for satisfaction. <clears throat> when you're thirsty, you want, you want something to drink to quench the thirst. When you're hungry, you want something to eat to satisfy your hunger. And they're very basic Even in a baby, these show up. Very early, right? They come out of the womb often crying, hungry, hungering and thirsting. Hunger and thirst is a good thing. It's an indication that we're alive. Sometimes, uh, and, and also an indication of good health, because sometimes when you're sick, you lose your appetite. You can't eat. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness is an indication that we are born again. Because it's a, it is a resource that God gives us when we're saved. He gives us a new hunger a hunger for things we weren't hungry for before, a thirst for things that we were not thirsty for before. And so the ones who have faced their spiritual poverty and mourned in humility over that poverty, trusted in God and not in themselves, God gives them a new hunger in a new thirst. I remember when I was first saved, I was just drawn to the Bible. I just wanted to read the Bible. I wanted to understand the Bible. I uh, found myself praying all the time. All the time. Whatever was going on, I, it, was, it was like a constant communion with the Lord. Because God placed within me a new hunger that wasn't there before. Next, verse 7, he gives, a, or, or notice before we go on there, but he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. God will fill you. He, he gives you the desire, and then he fills you. He gives you the hunger, and he gives you food to eat to satisfy the hunger. He gives you a new thirst and he gives you uh, something to drink to satisfy the thirst. And you find it is soul satisfying, something that you can't find in this world. There's nothing in this world that will satisfy your soul. It always hungers for something else and something different and something more. And, and, and you know that. I mean, from, from what you experience yourself and what you experience in the world, People are not satisfied. If, if a, there'd be no addictions if people weren't satisfied, if people were satisfied. But this little bit that gave me the high no longer does. I gotta have a little bit more and then a little more 
and then a little more. And what I was drawn to, as if it was going to bring something into my life, something positive and helpful, now I'm a slave to, and I'm under its dominion. It's because the only thing that satisfies the soul is what God gives us when he gives us this new hunger and thirst and satisfies it. Next, verse 7 he, he gives us as his, another resource, a new perspective. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. A person who is born again is born again by the mercy of God. They have received mercy from God. That's what they sought. They're spiritual beggars. That's all they can seek is mercy. Like a beggar sitting on the side of the road, he's just looking for mercy from the people who are going by that they'll look at him and have some pity on him and give him some money. (laughs) That's the picture, okay? That's how we come to God. We come to God sitting on the side of the road holding out our our cup, our, our plate or whatever we have and hoping that God will come by and show us mercy and give us something that we need because we don't have it in ourselves. And, we, and there's nothing we can do to get it. And so God has given us mercy. And because he's given us mercy, he changes our perspective in life and gives us a merciful perspective of life. If in, if in reality, I understand that I only know God because he's been merciful to me, that God hasn't given me what I deserve, he's given me his mercy. He's held back the things that I deserve because he's, he's done that in mercy and he placed it on his son, so his son bore it on the cross for me, he, he suffered the punishment for me so that I could receive mercy. How in the world can I not be merciful toward others? Blessed are the merciful. God saves. In love, he gives us mercy. And this has to change our perspective about ourselves and others. If we look at it honestly, this changes our perspective. We're no longer like we used to be, thinking... uh, You know, I I deserve better. I deserve more. Instead, we're realizing, oh, I'm glad I didn't get what I deserve. Do you go through life like that? Thank you, Lord, that I didn't get what I deserve. Instead, you've given me, out of your grace, what I don't deserve. All the favor of God, promise of heaven, being filled as I hunger and thirst for righteousness. As we live out God's mercy, we receive more mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the merciful. Well, as we, as we live out the mercy that God has given us when he saves us, we're merciful toward others, and as we're merciful toward others, we don't run out of mercy, we get more. We'll get more mercy to give. And so you, you never run out, you never run short. All the gifts that God gives, he gives in an abundance. And he gives just what we need to give out in our lives, to give out to others. Because we all need mercy. Don't we? We all need mercy. We've all messed up. And, and we, we continue to mess up. It doesn't completely stop, does it? Next, I want you to see he gives, as resources, he gives new desires. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the clean in heart. This word means, has the idea of being clean or free from dirt, unsoiled, no impurities. Notice, pure in heart. It's an internal purity. It's not not simply doing the right thing. It's something that's happening on the inside. 
It's a change that takes place internally, pure in heart. Yet, we've already mentioned Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Where does this purity of heart come from? It doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from something that, that we are able to do or purchase or, or achieve in some way. Uh, Mark 7 also describes the condition of our heart. Mark 7, verses 21 through 23, for from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within and defile a man. Jesus is revealing what Jeremiah said about the heart. He is showing that all the things that we do, all the wrong things we do, have come from within. They've come from a desire within. Not simply, ah, it's a woman you gave me, she gave it to me and I ate. Oh, Adam, there's more to it than that. The serpent deceived me and I ate. No, Eve, there's more to it than that. That there's something going on internally. This is, where, this is where sin resides, and sin is still in us. Even if we're saved, sin is still in us. It still resides there. And that thing within us deceives us. It leads us astray. But God, when he saves us, gives us new desires produced by his own spirit who is in us. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17 Apostle Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. And so he gives us the answer there. We, we still have old flesh in us. Old flesh is attracted to sin. Sin's still in us. And it can lead us astray. And he says... The flesh and the spirit are struggling with each other, against each other. They, they have totally different desires. And we're always saying yes to one and no to the other. So you don't do the things that you wish. So as the spirit is giving us desires and we act in the flesh, then we're resisting the spirit, saying no to the spirit. As the flesh is is enticing us and we hear what the Spirit says and obey the Spirit, then we're walking in the Spirit and saying no to the flesh. But you're saying no all the time. You're saying no all the time to some desire within you. Either to this desire the Spirit of God has produced or the desire that the flesh has produced. And we need to remember God has given us new desires. He's given us internal desires within us he's created a purity of heart that we didn't have before and at the heart at our heart there is purity that we can live out but we haven't left the flesh yet it's still with us but because of this purity of heart we can have an intimate relationship with God and we can have constant fellowship with him and so, as a believer, when I sin, I can confess that sin with the promise that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I just did that last week, and I confessed it. Now, now, now I'm doing it again, and I can, yeah. God remains faithful and just Boy, those are two powerful words. Faithful. He hears our confession and he's faithful. Faithful to his promises. Faithful to what he has done. And he's just. He doesn't go against his justice. We deserve judgment when we sin. We deserve his wrath. We deserve condemnation. But he is just because of what Christ has done to pay for our sin so he can forgive our sin because he sees us through his son, Jesus Christ. So blessed are the 
pure in heart, for they shall see God. And not only in the future, someday, when they go to be with him in glory, but they will see God in life. They will see what God is doing. They will see how God is working. They will see what God is accomplishing. They will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. They'll see God in everything. And then we see he gives us new behavior. In verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Purity of heart leads to peace and to peacemaking. And James uh, 3.17 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Notice where it starts. It is first pure, then peaceable. Peace comes from purity. It doesn't come from wickedness. It doesn't come from sin. There's no peace to the, for the wicked, the, the Bible says in Isaiah 48, 22. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Well, the, the wicked have no peace. Wickedness never brings peace. Only purity of heart brings peace. Uh, Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue peace and holiness, because the two go together. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 speaks of the God of peace. May the God of peace sanctify you, you being set apart to God. And again, purity and peace go together. Righteousness and peace have kissed, uh, Psalm 85, 10. So how do we have peace with God? And peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ as he has justified us. That's the only way we can have peace with God. It is through the gospel that we have peace with God. And it's through the gospel and living out the gospel that we can have peace, experience that peace in our daily lives. And being peacemakers, I think he's referring there to those who spread the gospel to others those who minister the gospel and show that the gospel is the answer for what we need in our souls. The basic need of every person is met in the gospel. And when we share the gospel, we're peacemakers. We're we're helping to make peace between men and God as we preach Jesus Christ. And our lives become filled with peace instead of turmoil because of what Christ has done and because of the new relationship I have now with the Lord. This is who we are. This is who we are as God's people. This is the church. This is, this is how he defines us, how he characterizes us. And then thirdly, the third main point, they wholeheartedly live for God's kingdom wholeheartedly live for God's kingdom. First of all, they live for God's righteousness. Here he says, blessed or happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He starts off with that, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven in verse 3, and he ends with it in verse 10. Now he's going to expand this particular uh, beatitude into verses 11 and 12, but he, it's kind of like these are the bookends here. You know, this, this kind of ties it all together. These are the people who will be in heaven. These are the people that will enjoy God forever and, and are his children and will be with him forever. They live for God's righteousness, so much so that they're willing to be persecuted for righteousness. Persecuted because they live righteously. They live out these beatitudes. They live for Jesus. They live for his, uh, according to his will and his desires and his standard, his righteous standard. 
they follow Jesus, their shepherd, who leads in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so they follow close to him on the, in those paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Again, to the point where they are willing to be persecuted because they live out these beatitudes. They live according to the gospel that's contained in these beatitudes. Next, notice they live for God's pleasure. Verse 11, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, for my sake. Now, why would they, why would they do all of that? It's because you have proclaimed yourself to be a follower of Christ, not only a follower of Christ, but that you're committed to doing the will of Christ. You're, you're committed to him. You're committed to living for what pleases him. And people, you find out that there are people that don't like that. That, that actually makes them angry enough so that they will revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. For my sake, he said, for Christ's sake. We're blessed because we seek to please God more than we seek to please people. That's a struggle, isn't it? Because often pleasing God is not pleasing people. Or you're afraid that if you please God, people will be offended or hurt. But he says here, blessed are you when people find fault with you because of your commitment to the Lord. Because you're committed to him. You're blessed, happy. That's a good position to be in he says, to be persecuted like that. Reminded me of Daniel. You remember Daniel? Back in uh, Daniel chapter 6, when there was all kinds of uh, jealousy going on, and, and they were trying to find fault with Daniel. And they looked at him and his relationship with the king and, and his, his work as a governor, and, and they couldn't find any fault with him. You know, he, he did his job well. He represented the king well. And so it says in verse 5 of that chapter, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Wouldn't that be great to have a life like that? <laughs> Can't find any fault with him except at how, how he obeys his God how he pleases his God and does what his God wants him to do. Jesus said the person like that is blessed, is blessed. And in verse 12, one who lives for God's joy, rejoice, be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In, in our day, among Christians, it seems, we have this, this worldly mindset that, that life is just supposed to be full of pleasure and no problems and no difficulties. And everybody's supposed to like us and uh, everybody's supposed to agree with us. Oh. How would you like to be one of the prophets? Standing up uh, to, to the nation of Israel or Judah saying, thus says the Lord, and getting thrown in a dungeon or getting sawn in two, getting stoned, and not with alcohol, but with, with real stones. Being put to death, persecuted. The prophets were persecuted because they represented God. I don't know why we think we won't face persecution. Now, I'm not saying we seek it <laughs> or even or want it. But what we want is the joy of the Lord. And he says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. If this happens to you, rejoice and be exceedingly glad because there's a great reward for you in heaven. If you're living for God's righteousness and you're living for God's pleasure, 
then there will be joy in that. That's how you live for God's joy. You live like those of old who committed their lives to the Lord, committed themselves to God's righteousness, committed themselves to God's pleasure, and found joy even in the midst of persecution. Because there is a great eternal reward waiting for us. So everyone who is part of the church that Jesus is building has these characteristics. To one degree or another, these characteristics are there. So we're, we're different now than we used to be. We're still able to sin. Uh, it's one reason we look forward to glory, isn't it? We won't be able to sin up there. It'll all be, all be in the past. We'll, we'll leave it all behind. And we look forward to that. But until then, we still sin. And we still sorrow again over our condition, over being beggars, spiritual beggars. But the church that Jesus is building, he's building with people like this. He's building it with beatitude people. Because that's what it means to be saved. The people that are spiritual beggars who have a deep godly sorrow over their sinful condition. They're people who humbly agree with God about their sin. That's where it starts. That we've sinned against God and we seek his mercy. We don't seek to make excuses. We don't seek to explain ourselves away, to justify ourselves before God. We simply come to an agreement with God that I have sinned and it's all my fault. I can't blame anyone else. And what I need is mercy. When we come to God that way, God creates a new life in us with a new hunger and a new perspective, new desires and new behavior. This, this new life and relationship with God becomes more important to us than anything else and everything else. It's what we live for. It's why we're here. So much so that we're willing to suffer because we want to please God. Because we want to honor God. We want to follow God. And that's my, my deep longing and hunger and desire within my soul. They align themselves with God, finding that their joy is with him and in him. It's not in this world. So this is who we are as a church, as we gather together, as individuals. This is who we are. This is what God has done. And this is how we have approached God. And this is what he's accomplished within us. We are ones who have been saved by the mercy of and grace of God alone. We nothing of ourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Saved by the mercy and grace of God and equipped to serve him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the work that you do that is described here in these Beatitudes. A work we could not accomplish ourselves. In fact, the work that we do not deserve in any way. It is a work of your mercy, even for us to be able to see that we are in a needy condition, spiritual beggars. It's a work of your grace and mercy uh, for us to sorrow in a godly way that leads to repentance, a true change of heart, a change of, of life and attitude and behavior. Father, it's, it's a work of you to give us the resources that we need, even, even to be humble before you, and to give us what we need to live out this life. Help us to live for you, Lord. Help us to live in the reality of your resources for us. Uh, help us to live in the power of the Spirit of God and walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. 
Father, I pray that if there are any here without Christ, still in their sin, still under your judgment and condemnation, Father, help them to see that your evaluation is the only true evaluation. It's the only correct one. Everything else is from a deceived heart. And that there is mercy with God when we see our sin for what it is and we humbly sorrow over it and confess it to, to the Lord. And may they turn in faith to the only one who can save, and that is Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for gathering us here this morning. Bless your word. May it, it penetrate our hearts and change our perspective and give us hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.